good morning good afternoon and good evening to delegates attending from different parts of the world welcome to the fourth plenary session of seventh international conference on recent advances in geotechnical earthquake engineering and soil dynamics in this session we will be having two keynote presentations by one by professor elgama and the second one by professor charles ng this session will be chaired by dr g r reddy and dr vishwas katri before i hand over the session to chair and co chair i would like to briefly introduce our chair and co chair our chair dr reddy has vast research and academic experience he has guided 10 phd and 41 mtech students these research areas are modeling techniques for complex structures structure equipment interaction stochastic methods substructure techniques etc he involved in the design of several important critical facilities including antenna for chandrayaan project and gamma ray telescope and many other he has also developed products like dampers isolator and observers he developed iterative response spectrum for non linear systems he has 500 publications including journals reports and conference proceedings he has also authored a book titled seismic design structures piping systems and components published by springer as a president of association of structural rehabilitation he has developed guidelines he worked collaborate and collaborated in 35 research projects at the national and international level our co-chair dr vishwas katri is currently working as assistant professor at the indian institute of technology ism danbar he has worked on experimental and numerical modeling of geotechnical stability problems he has authored as well as co-authored several journal and conference proceedings both at national and international level with this brief introduction may i now request dr reddy and dr vishwas to kindly take over the session please sir so thank you very much uh, dr ravi for uh, the introduction uh, i welcome uh, uh, you know the speakers uh, invited speakers as well as the delegates and the organizers uh, to uh, participate uh, in this particular session uh, so before uh, inviting dr ahmed to give his uh, lecture i try to i, I will uh, introduce him uh, yes please uh, so one second dr ahmed is a professor of geotechnical engineering at the university of california san diego currently he is serving as the school of engineering associate dean for faculty affairs earlier he chaired the department of structural engineering from 2003 to 2007 he received uh, his phd in 1985 from uh, uh, princeton uh, university princeton university in uh, 1997 he joined uh, ucst after a post doctoral appointment at the california institute of technology and faculty positions at rpi and uh, columbia university in new york his areas of research interest include liquefaction and effects on the built environment large scale soil structure interact soil structure experimental and computational simulation sustainability in geomechanics information technology applications and the system identification procedures he is author and co-author of uh, over 300 technical publications and currently serves as editor in chief of the journal of soil dynamics and uh, earthquake engineering over the years he has consulted and provided professional services in the general areas of geomechanics and the geotechnical engineering for a number of national and international organizations so i request uh, professor ahmed to deliver a lecture on non linear soil structure interaction and application for bridge uh, systems in liquefaction liquefaction liquefiable ground i welcome uh, dr ahmed to uh, deliver his uh, you know uh, ex excellent lecture and i request all the people to participate and uh, let us uh, you know uh, get a lot of knowledge from the professor ahmed thank you very much i request uh, dr ahmed uh, to start his lecture Th thank you thank you very much chair reddy um 
maybe before I start, I would just like to update a little bit what you mentioned. I completed my term as associate dean and also my term as editor in chief of the Journal of Soil Dynamics uh, and Earthquake Engineering, which was a, a great privilege. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone. Um, I would like to con congratulate the uh, uh, conference chair and the organizing committee for the incredible job they have done in uh, preparing this uh, remote event and all the preparations uh, that uh, preceded this when the conference was to be held uh, in person. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor to, uh, uh, to join you uh, and have this opportunity to present my lecture. So let me please share my screen. Yes, uh, uh, sorry for interrupting, uh, Dr. Ahmad, you have 40 minutes. Uh, kindly uh, let us see that, you know, you will uh, uh, complete your lecture uh, so that we'll have some time for uh, interactions. Please. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, love. Uh, I think you can see my screen now. Yeah, it's good. Yes, very good. Yes. Thank you. So. I would like to focus today on uh, simulation, computational simulation of nonlinear soil structure interaction with some applications, including applications for bridge systems uh, and liquefaction. Uh, it's been a long journey um, trying to um, develop better tools for uh, analysis of soil structure interaction. And uh, it's still a continuing journey uh, where I will leave off, others will continue. Uh, so some progress has been made and I hope to share with you some insights and highlights of work that has been done over the years. Uh, many researchers over the years have uh, contributed to this work. Some of them are, uh, their names are here on this slide. And of course, uh, uh, over the years as well, funding from many uh, organizations was uh, secured to uh, support graduate students and so forth. So some of the funding agencies are also shown on this slide. Uh, in particular, more recently, uh, three PhD theses, uh, as you see here, uh, are, uh, contain, contain much of the work, the recent work that I will present today. So I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jean B, uh, Dr. Ahmed Evedo, and Dr. Jizian Q. Um, so why do we need uh, a uh, soil structure interaction and the need for an analysis framework? So uh, when this effort started, uh, an attempt was being made to produce three-dimensional simulation tools tailored for conducting seismic response. And hopefully these tools would include the latest nonlinear non structural analysis techniques, for example, beam column fiber elements, Hope gap elements and all other kinds of uh, simulation tools for, for modeling structural response and soil structure interaction, and also include state of the art nonlinear soil modeling capabilities, include saturated soil mo modeling logics, uh, and suited for the needs of performance based earthquake engineering, which includes uh, low levels of shaking, medium levels of shaking, and very strong levels of shaking, and the consequence of these shaking um, uh, events. And um, having these tools available in the public domain, uh, including the source code. So, so this work started more than 20 years ago with the Pacific Center for Earthquake Engineering, where they uh, set up a platform, no, as you know, known as Open Seas. And over the years, we were um, able to contribute to this platform by including nonlinear soil response models um, and uh, fully coupled uh, solid fluid formulations for uh, liquefaction and along with that pressure dependent and pressure independent uh, soil models as you see uh, here uh, schematically displayed in this slide. Um, again, um, to get these tools to be uh, representative or more representative, 
much effort has always been taking place related to calibration. So this is some of, uh, just an illustration of uh, our participation in uh, the project LEAP uh, for um, numerical simulation of centrifuge experiments that were conducted under this project under the leadership of uh, Professor Scutter, Munzari, Ziegel, and Weida and others. Um, and uh, as you see, even with the availability of results from centrifuge experiments and um, of course one dimensional downhole arrays uh, recorded uh, motions from actual earthquakes, there is still room for uh, getting more realistic outcomes uh, out of the numerical tools when they are applied to uh, three-dimensional simulation and in particular as it relates to soil structure interaction which places additional demands on the level of strains that take place in the vicinity of the structure uh, as the structure pushes and pulls on the soil uh, as I'll try to show some of that now. So um, I will try to present some uh, of our work related to uh, three-dimensional soil structure interaction and uh, look at situations where uh, strains are relatively, shear strains are relatively small, for example, uh, where equivalent linear analysis might uh, yield reasonable outcomes. And then we'll look at large strains, uh, elastoplastic uh, analysis, and then we'll see some scenarios where the strains are, are um, much larger of the order, let's say, of 10% associated with liquefaction. And then some of the strains, again, um, as a consequences of liquefaction in the vicinity of a foundation where the soil flows around the foundation uh, with strains that you know are much larger than 10 percent and uh, trying to show this in the context of three-dimensional numerical simulations so we look at um, the response of an embedded structure and also take this as an opportunity to look at uh, site response away from the structure. And then we'll look at um, large pile groups, we'll look at uh, a wharf on piles, we will look at three-dimensional bridge systems, including liquefaction. So let's start with site response and uh, embedded structures as uh, in situations, for example, of nuclear power, power plant containment structures. So uh, in this study, as you see, the soil mesh is very large compared with the size of the structure, which is substantial in and of its own. Because of symmetry, it's a two-dimensional mesh and the shaking is taking place in this lateral direction. So this is what is shown here as a half mesh. And then with the input motion imparted at the base of the ground, um, we studied the outcomes if this motion is scaled by one, if it's doubled in amplitude, three times in amplitude and four times in amplitude to compare um, the response of fully nonlinear and equivalent linear under these different four levels of seismic excitation. We also included a no tension uh, condition here between the structure and the soil, which, of, which is a more realistic way to model the interaction. And we had the transmitting boundary at the base. Um, and uh, we used this soil model, which is a pressure uh, dependent soil mo model or our nonlinear analysis. Uh, as you know, in the equivalent linear analysis, uh, the work is done by uh, a second modulus and equi equivalent damping at a particular shear strain level. And you see here that the reduction in uh, modulus with strain amplitude is quite substantial. For example, here we go down approximately to 20% of initial, initial shear modulus at a strain of 0.3%. So if we look at the free field ground response in the beginning, we're showing here the shaking uh, as it was, and then the shaking when it was scaled to four times its amplitude, so that's much, much higher shaking. We see at ground surface that uh, the 
at low levels of shaking, non, the, as you might expect, the non-linear model and the equivalent linear yield very reasonable results and very close. The response at ground surface is significantly larger than the response at the level of the base of the structure at 23 meters depth, if you compare this six and this four. And when you go to the four times the level of shaking, you see, of course, that because of nonlinear effects, that this uh, resonance peak uh, is much muted and it is spread over the frequency range compared with uh, the low level of shaking. And both the equivalent linear and nonlinear, uh, to some degree, reproduce this. The only limitation really is that the equivalent linear analysis uh, uh, subdues the high frequency response that is shown by the fully nonlinear analysis, as you can see here in these boxes uh, at uh, higher frequencies. And this might be something that is somewhat important for secondary systems that might be embedded within this, uh, in, uh, that might be uh, inside of this embedded uh, structure. Okay, so we go now to this, the response of the structure itself. And since the structure is at 23 meters below ground at its base, and the structure is fairly rigid, the first thing we see when we compare its response to the free field is that at the, at the ground surface, the structural response is much less. Also, the high frequency response, which is a consequence to some degree of site amplification in the upper uh, several meters of the ground, is much reduced. And in general, the response of the structure is very similar to its response at its base, at 23 meters depth, which is, of course, something that helps the structure a, a lot in having lower amplitudes of, uh, of uh, shaking and response. So the deeper this, the embedment of the structure is, the less uh, levels of shaking that will be observed compared to the nearby free field, which is good news. Again, this is show, shown at one times the shaking and four times the shaking. The same thing where you see the free field is always much higher than the response of the structure, which is similar to its response at its embedded depth. So when we found that um, the response of the structure is much less this way compared with ground surface response, and the high frequency response is uh, much less as well. We ended up finding that whereas the equivalent linear analysis didn't do as good a job in the free field, it actually did a much better job for the structural response. Since the structure does not amplify the high frequency response or is not aff affected as much by the high frequency response near ground surface, and its response is similar to its response at, uh, at, at the base, we found that the nonlinear and equivalent linear comparison is uh, quite favorable for the structure response itself. We also looked at earth pressure, uh, lateral earth pressure on the structure. Uh, and uh, some of the observations we saw, since this is a three-dimensional simulation, is that the changes in the, the dynamic earth pressures affect this 45 degree part of the structure from the front and the back. And here in this part, since the shaking is only in this direction, uh, this part of the structure does not see much change at all in uh, the static state of, of pressure. So this is the pressure on the right side of the structure pressure profile. This is the pressure profile on the left side of the structure. And uh, in this, this section, that is, in a sense, parallel to the direction of shaking, the earth pressure doesn't change very much. The other interesting thing is that the distribution of earth pressure uh, on the, uh, as the soil, in the instant where the soil is moving in this direction, as you see here, is, takes this shape on the left side of the structure. Of course, there is, an inertial force also coming from own weight of the structure, pushing on the soil. But on the right side, the soil is also moving away from the structure. And near the top, a gap opens, as you see here, and there is no pressure on the structure momentarily. And then the pressures 
as a reaction uh, show up on the other on on this side and have a distribution that looks something like this and actually becomes quite high at the base if you think you know the base is wedged and pushes on the soil hard since the structure also experiences some rotation so when you look at this distribution of earth pressures and compare it with the classical mononobi or probably earth pressure theory you see that there is really uh, no relationship between the mo analysis and uh, the actual distribution of dynamic earth pressure uh, on embedded structures as you see here so uh, in summary uh, for the ground response, the site response at these relatively low levels of strain, equivalently analysis are reasonable, but underestimate high frequency response. And for the structure itself, the high frequency response is much reduced. The acceleration at the top is very similar to its acceleration at the base, which is quite lower than the uh, free field acceleration. And uh, the acceleration response compared well, the equivalent linear acceleration response compared well with the nonlinear counterpart all around and gave a reasonable result that way. And then seismic lateral earth pressure is quite different from the mononobi Okabe analysis. Now, moving on to large pile groups. Uh, that was, there was an opportunity to look at the behavior of a pile group in a bridge where navigation is uh, allowed in the center of the canyon or in the center of the channel of the water channel for this Dumbarton bridge scenario, for example. And as you see, to allow for this navigation near the center of the channel, the bridge is, is very high. As you see here, uh, when we go to look at the bridge along its uh, side view and we look here in the center, we see that uh, these piers are, the deck is 27 meters above water level. And then there is the uh, pile cap and then 14 meters into the water is where the mud line is. And then the piles are embedded 16 meters into the ground. So between the deck and the mud line, we have about 40 meters of elevation. And so when shaking comes laterally, uh, in addition to the shear force that will be experienced by the pile group, you see that a huge moment will also be acting because of this very large moment arm and the pile group will be subjected to a very large moment and at the same time, a very large shear force. Uh, whereas we tend to study for seismic analysis, um, pile groups uh, under lateral load, as you see in this, uh, as I will try to show in this case, axial loads coming from that moment are much more uh, important potentially and uh, might actually be the main cause for trouble compared with the shear force alone. So um, we use this platform, uh, OpenCSPL, which is uh, capable of producing uh, finite element meshes uh, in a user interface to um, look at pile groups that way. And with a pressure uh, independent soil, elastoplastic soil model, we looked at uh, the bridge on weight effects and the effects under lateral pushover analysis equivalent to as high as the weight of the deck um, in the horizontal direction as if there is a pulse of 1G applied to the bridge. And you can see that the response the, of the pile group is highly nonlinear compared with, with its initial response because of the behavior of uh, the piles, obviously, but also uh, the nonlinear soil uh, in, in this simulation. Um, moments uh, on the piles in this case were, of course, uh, as you might know, corner piles ended up shouldering much more load than 
um, some, uh, inner piles. This is again a half mesh. And so these are the inner piles, these are the outer piles, and this is the former pile. And as the level of load increases, you see that the peak moment location is going downwards into the ground because of yield of the soil gradually from the uh, high displacements of the pile from the mud line further down. Now looking at axial forces, just under the own weight, static own weight of the bridge, you see again that the corner piles carry much more of the axial load than the inner piles. And the edge piles also carry higher load than the inner piles, which is, of course, documented in the literature as uh, an important mechanism because of the avail availability of more outer soil here to resist uh, load compared with the soil that is shared here by many piles and uh, experiences load from many piles at the same time. And consequently, these piles are, in a sense, end up being in a, in a flexible part of the soil and carry much less load compared with these outer piles and the corner pile in particular. Now, if we look at the situation where the pushover just included the horizontal force first, uh, instead of the force and moment together, we see that the loads on the uh, piles increase in, in the front here where there is compression, increase a lot more, and also turn from being compressive to tensile because of that very large moment, being 3.4 times, for example, the uh, axial load under static load, if, if you know, as a normalizing quantity being a single, if for a single pile scenario. So three times the load in tension as compared with one time the load in compression under the, just the own weight of the bridge. When we include the moment as well, you can see now axial loads increase to nearly 10 times in, in the outer pile in compression and also about nine times or so uh, intention. I don't think any pile or pile cap is designed to deal with tensile forces that are of this order. And there is a very high probability, if a scenario like this happens, that uh, there will be separation between the uh, pile and um, the pile cap. That might not necessarily imply any uh, collapse or any uh, uh, large deformations in the end, because at the end of the earthquake, the pile cap might come back and just sit on this damaged pile uh, head. And um, um, there won't necessarily be an apparent um, um, permanent deformation, uh, since other piles might be able to uh, continue supporting the bridge. But there can be damage that will later lead to deterioration of the bridge because of the elements and so forth. And uh, it's certainly an un undesirable outcome. So the main outcome here is that um, axial response is potentially much more important than lateral response for scenarios like this, where there is a large moment that is involved. Tensile forces might be quite significant and affect the reinforced concrete response. Um, and the corner piles are most vulnerable, and all these are things that are shown by this three-dimensional simulation of this pile. OK, if we look at uh, a scenario of, again, uh, wharfs on piles, these are, uh, types of structures are, are the prevalent type of uh, wharf foundation in the United States. This is a picture, picture from the Port of Los Angeles. The ship is here, the container ship is here, and the wharf is here. This is a close-up of the wharf, and here is the container ship. And this wharf is supported on many, many piles, as you see here. In cross-section, the piles look something like this. This is the uh, land side. This is the water side. This is the slope, sloping ground under the, the wharf. This is the deck of the wharf, and these are the piles going into the slope as you see here. 
So when we looked at the plan view of this wharf, we saw that the pattern of the piles keeps on repeating itself uh, from one end of the wharf to the other. And so that allows that we could take a three-dimensional slice and study it as a representative of the response of the entire war from beginning to end. A, a symmetry slice, if you will, but it's, it's a three-dimensional slice. So this is here the three-dimensional slice. These are the piles uh, front to land side, water side to land side. And this becomes the three-dimensional slice that we are studying. The soil on the land side, the soil on the water side, the 16 piles that represent the symmetry um, section of, of the wharf. And uh, again, doing seismic excitation by shaking at the base, by including here one-dimensional shear beam columns that capture boundary conditions on the right and on the left, which is essentially free field response on the land side, free field response on the water side. So before looking at the three-dimensional response, some people were proposing and maybe continue to propose that if someone does a slope analysis without the presence of the pile and then takes these deformed configurations of the slope at the location of the piles, that this might permit that they can take these displacements and then use soil springs uh, and apply these uh, uh, displacements to the pile, the piles. But in fact, when the piles are present in the slope, you see that the displaced the, the, the uh, configuration of the ground is very very different from the configuration without the piles. And so, to a great extent, that really doesn't work. The Piles change the configuration of the deformation of the slope, and this displacement pattern is very different from the pattern if the piles were not present. So here is the deformed configuration after shaking, and uh, it's obvious that all piles actually, the piles that have uh, a free length, a very large free length, and the ones that have a very small free length all deform in a similar way because they're all deforming according to the, defor the deformation of the slope. And in a sense, it's, it's all an integrated deformation. There is no uh, additional deformation in the front, for example, compared to the back. So in general, to a great extent, the front piles and the back piles undergo very similar displacements and undergo relatively similar moments which was something, again, where some people were proposing that uh, the front piles, because of their free length, are more flexible, and so they suffer less than the back pile that doesn't have as much free length. Uh, as importantly, again, since all these piles are connected to a very rigid uh, deck at the top, uh, because of the deformation of the slope downwards on the land side and upwards on the water side, uh, all kinds of tensile forces evolve in the pile in the piles. They're all again connected at the top. So you get compression, you get uh, additional tension, and depending on the part of the pile in the softer soil and the part of the pile in the stiffer soil, you get all these kinds of changes. Uh, and it's again likely that tensile forces might play a very significant role in the integrity of um, the uh, wharf on pile scenario compared with just uh, the attention that everyone pays to uh, lateral deformation and consequences of the additional moments imposed on the pile. So what this, this is what this slide, uh, slice is attempting to say, that in addition to bending, uh, axial piles are uh, axial loads are uh, quite important and require further attention. Okay, so going to quickly to bridge ground systems, um, three-dimensional simulation for bridges is actually something that leads to much more realistic outcomes. 
Um, this was an effort that was done uh, early on several years ago, and the idea was to try to capture some of the things that idealizations in 2D uh, are not able to capture. So for example, uh, the 3D pile foundation configuration, the 3D ground response, and the 3D characteristics of the response of the deck and abutments uh, can only be captured if the simulation is done in three dimensions. So this was the uh, mesh that was constructed for this uh, bridge in California. And you see the approach, uh, ground approach ramps, you see the bridge, you see here the foundation systems in 3D and the shaking itself is also done in three dimensions. Um, OpenSeas allows for, uh, as I mentioned earlier, integration of state-of-the-art uh, fiber element, beam column elements to represent the uh, nonlinear response of the bridge structural elements. So along with the nonlinear soil response, uh, you see that also the um, bridge is modeled also using the latest tools that were available for uh, nonlinear response of the reinforced concrete. Uh, and these were uh, tools that are still available in open seas by Professor Philip Filippo of UC Berkeley. So uh, at the end of shaking, compared with observation where you see lateral spreading leads to uh, soil going into towards the center of the canyon, leads to spreading of the approach ramps also sideways, leads to uh, pushing on the bridge, as you see here, that these characteristics are reproduced, uh, at least conceptually, in this three-dimensional simulation. And we get a little bit of heave of the soil here, since the soil is moving into the center of the water channel. And then settlement, of course, here. And here is the, that outer spreading of the approach ramps. This is the final deformed configuration of the bridge. You see that um, there is settlement uh, of the abutments, as we observe in earthquakes. There is a rotation of the abutment, as we observe in earthquakes. There is a permanent translation of the foundations in the zones that have moved sideways near the abutments. And then near the center of the bridge, you see that uh, these foundations do not move much. The soil here is not moving much, but the deck itself might be moving permanently and also causing lateral uh, deformations of the supporting piers of the bridge. In addition to what is happening in the uh, longitudinal direction of the bridge, also in the transverse direction of the bridge, there are deformations from the shaking. So uh, the the bridge does not uh, uh, deform uniformly in the transverse direction. This is the final deformed configuration of the bridge looking at plan view in the transverse direction. And you see that there are additional uh, consequence to the three-dimensional shaking coming from the transverse response in addition to the longitudinal response. Okay, moving on to looking at bridges under liquefaction. Uh, we have been looking at a, a few actual bridge con, uh, scenarios from uh, California, uh, where you see now that the bridge has different structural uh, configurations uh, under, uh, uh, at different sections of it, and different uh, cross sections of uh, the support of the shear wall or the columns or the piles. And the soil is also not uniform along the uh, longitudinal direction of the bridge. Different soils, are, according to the borings, idealized here in terms of three different configurations on the left, in the center, and on the right of the bridge. Uh, everything, again, for the bridge is modeled with fiber elements. And similar to what we have done for the wharf, we attempted to also take a slice in the bridge in its longitudinal direction. Of course, this slice is not as representative because the bridge is not wide enough in the transverse direction like the wharf. But 
it also allowed us to um, observe some mecha mecha mechanisms of the response that are uh, quite significant. Uh, in this case, we did shaking using uh, Rinaldi motions from the Northridge earthquake. And it's a, the important thing about it is that it's a near field motion that has a pulse, a preferred pulse in one direction. And so you will see in a second that this has a consequence on the response of the bridge. And that in addition to the ground deformation near the slopes and the abutments that you expect, of course, the soil to flow towards the center of the channel on both sides. But also, as you see here on the end, the entire ground ends up with a permanent deformation in a preferred direction because of this near field pulse. And if you reverse the input, the direction of the motion, what is positive in acceleration becomes negative, and what is negative becomes positive, this permanent deformation will revert to the other direction. And so what is really happening here and here is a consequence of this overall, overall lurch because of the near field pulse, plus the slope deformations on both sides. And uh, you add this up and you get out. And you can see that, of course, the, uh, because, because of this permanent lurch, the deck moves forward permanently this way on both sides. And along with this forward motion, also the, that slope is pushing on the deck this way. And so we end up with the soil on the right side here pushing to the left. And because of the forces coming from the deformation on the left side and the lurch, the deck moves to the right. And so we end up with trouble here, not only coming from the slope deformation, but also coming from the deck moving in the opposite direction and causing this forward motion at the top, backward motion uh, below, and causing additional trouble to the piles. So these piles are affected actually by what is happening on the other side, not only what is happening in that local slope. And it emphasizes the need to look at response in three dimensions, uh, and also looking at the integrated response of the bridge ground system uh, with the whole bridge involved, not only looking at one slope at a time. In the center of the channel, the foundation doesn't move much, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the deck moves permanently, and that again can result in unseating, can result in uh, large moments on these middle section piles, which of course is something that is not captured at all when people study the left side on its own or study the right side on, on its own under lateral spreading because of uh, local deformation at the abutments. So uh, this is what this slide is trying to summarize. And uh, in the end, the most important thing is looking at the, the, the bridge and the ground as a system and not looking at one side at a time. As you see from this study, there is trouble on the left, there is trouble on the right. Some of the trouble on the right is coming from the motion of the bridge into uh, uh, to the right, affecting what is happening here. And also in the center of the bridge, uh, the trouble is not coming from the deformation of the foundations, but coming from the permanent deformation of the deck to the right and where the foundations don't move much. Uh, when we looked at what we call a short span bridge, where the two slopes are, as you see here in a narrow canyon, close to each other, then we saw significant interaction between the deformation of the slopes. So you see here displacement of the left slope inter interferes with displacement of the right slope and leads actually to much less uh, lateral deformation compared with studying, for example, the right slope, which was the more vulnerable slope on its own. So if you just looked at uh, the scenario of the left slope on its own, or this right slope on its own, the deformation under the same shaking was five meters, which only was on two thirds of a meter because of the interaction when the full canyon was involved and there was a slope here 
on that side. So again, it uh, leads us to think of the importance and the significance of doing a system response and a three-dimensional analysis to capture the more realistic picture as opposed to looking at one section at a time. So um, some of these tools are available at this website, soilquake.net. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these tools were developed for open seas. More recently, we tried to make some of these tools also available for uses in other codes like FLAC, LS Dyna, and Diana and Abacus. So you will find some information about this on the Soilquake uh, uh, link, the Soilquake link. And also, if you're interested in uh, calibration and actual data from recorded earthquakes from downhole arrays, we had this data and we have uploaded it for these two locations and it's available to download at the site as well. So for your own use. I think my time is up. I need to turn this off. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, maybe you can uh, <laughs> I request you to slowly wind up. Yeah, no problem. Yes, I am. Um, and then finally, um, some recent work to look at also uh, geometric nonlinearity is being directed towards uh, a technique uh, that is shown here. Um, so this is a meshless um, representation as opposed to finite elements that uh, lends itself more to looking at very large deformations with also strain softening soil models that have been recently developed. And uh, this work is ongoing. We're trying to also capture some aspects of geometric def deformation in addition to the material uh, nonlinear deformations. Uh, and so we would uh, also bring into the picture geometric nonlinearities. Okay, I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. Uh, Professor Ahmad for giving a very uh, informative lecture. Uh, you know, I request a co-chair to just prepare for a question answer session. Uh, meanwhile, I'll just uh, uh, summarize uh, what, uh, you know, I could understand from the lecture of uh, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, so uh, co-chair, please uh, get uh, ready for the question answer sessions. Maybe you can uh, have to go to the box where a lot yes. of questions may be there. We can kindly get prepared. Just one minute, I'll just try to summarize and uh, say maybe I'll initiate one question. <laughs> yeah, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, you know, he introduced, uh, Professor has introduced uh, the subject uh, with, uh, uh, you know, containment structure, uh, uh, you know, the uh, effect of uh, equivalent nonlinear analysis and uh, detailed nonlinear analysis, uh, how the difference in the response of the containment, including the soil, and, uh, you know, the variation of frequencies and the amplitudes, if you take the you know, soil structure interaction and uh, nonlinear effects of the, uh, say, in you know, a soil that he explained very nicely, given a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, insight of the subject. Then he introduced, uh, you know, he uh, explained on the pushover analysis of the bridges is very, very important uh, because uh, the subject uh, now, I think everybody going for the performance based design of structure. So soil definitely cannot be ignored. So you have to consider that. So a procedure for doing the pushover analysis and uh, seeing the various uh, uh, in levels of performances under earthquake loads, considering the bridge, he has explained very nicely. And a lot of cases uh, with respect to bridges and the port structures, he explained very clearly and is very, very interesting that his uh, lecture says uh, in all the designers, you have to take the nonlinear effects when you want to say that the bridges structures are safe for earthquake loading. So I just uh, triggered the session on the question answers. Uh, I, can you please elaborate on the slicing, uh, slicing you know, on the bridge? when you are taking the modeling and you are making model and analysis. I, this is a request uh, uh, from my side to trigger the question and answer session so that our co-chair will be ready for the you know, question answers, please. Yeah, session, yes, please. Dr. Ahmad, please. Thanks uh, very, very much because a wonderful lecture. I learned a lot of things from your lecture and uh, I also uh, you know, uh, generated a lot of thinking uh, you know, or how to go over in the future, what is the research we can perform. Thank you very much. Please, yes, please, uh, Dr. Ahmad.
uh, excuse me, sir, just a small announcement. May I make? Yeah, please, please. Let me uh, yeah. Dr. Ravi. Uh, yeah. All, all, yeah, all the delegates are uh, requested uh, to post their questions under Q&A that uh, is available on the menu bar. Uh, and also, there is an icon placed uh, over the conference platform. To, ac to access Q&A, you need to come out of from the full screen mode. Then only you can be able to access. Okay, thank you, thank you one and all. Okay, sir. Uh, Professor Algamal, please. Yes, I see three questions. Uh, should I try to answer those now? Yeah, please go ahead. I think that, yes, uh, Dr. Viswas, please. Uh, yes, I think, I think I will. Okay, the first question is uh, about push, the pushover analysis on the pile group. Uh, and yes, uh, of course, there are. Can, can yes. I read it for you? Can I read it for you? Please. No need. Yeah. In a pushover analysis, a load pattern is applied with increasing magnitude in a single direction. But in reality, there are frequent stress reversal during an earthquake. So, what is the reason to trust result from pushover analysis? This is the question post. First question. Yes, if, if there is an earthquake loading um, a dynamic analysis is definitely needed and so what we did with the pushover analysis because we tried to use an, a high as refined a mesh as we could uh, um, implement on the computer resources we had at the time uh, dynamic analysis and actual earthquake shaking would have uh, not been possible and so we resorted to illustrate some of the uh, salient consequences of lateral loading to this pushover analysis. But this isn't a replacement of doing actual seismic excitation. On the other hand, if it is expected, for instance, that peak acceleration of the bridge deck would reach 0.6 G or uh, any other value, there might be a way to uh, uh, apply a force that would be equivalent to uh, the lateral inertial force that would come from a peak acceleration of 0.3 G at pushover and in a sense see uh, uh, maximum force, under maximum force, uh, what levels of uh, deformation and if any permanent deformation of significance might happen. I hope the person who posed the question, he got his doubts clear. So second question we are having is, Sir, how to decide upon mitigation measure or the design solution for prevention the damage to critical infrastructure during the earthquake using FE simulation? Question is very long. Yes, sir. again think, another. Please. Yeah, I think I will repeat it. How to decide upon mitigation measures or the design solutions for preventing the damages to critical infrastructure during earthquake using FE simulation? Yes, another very good question, similar uh, to the first one in insightful. Um, you might have noticed, noticed that some of the representations that were uh, studied were idealizations, even though they are three-dimensional, they still are really not the entire three-dimensional picture and they were an idealization in the end. Uh, because again of the difficulties in being conducted more uh, elaborate and more realistic, fully three-dimensional uh, uh, analyses of, of large and complicated structures. On the other hand, these simulations uh, permit to some extent also gaining insight about possible mitigation, implementation of possible mitigation measures. So in some of the studies that we have done for the liquefaction of the, uh, and its effect on the bridges, for example, is that with that three-dimensional slice that we used for the uh, representation of the bridge, even though it is not as you know, realistic as modeling the entire bridge, but in this environment, we looked at scenarios where, where if there is ground modification done at certain locations, what is the outcome? If there are additional piles installed, what is the outcome? And so it was a very good environment and a useful environment for 
doing parametric studies to see uh, different mitigation uh, techniques and their outcomes. And uh, I hope this answers the question about that the finite element analysis might be useful for looking at also countermeasures and mitigation along with the response of the original structure. Uh, last question we are having, sir, is how practical are fully 3D simulation in typical design practice? Very good question as well. <laughs> and I think um, um, three-dimensional simulations, there is no question remain to be difficult to undertake. And uh, especially for design practice, I see sometimes very, very large three-dimensional simulations. Um, and even though um, it, it looks like uh, the, the simulation ought to produce uh, extremely real, re realistic outcome on account of the very large number of elements and uh, attention to several details, but just because there are so many things that need to be taken care of and also um, load stages and construction uh, sequences and so forth, we have to in the end uh, keep that in mind and uh, know that any three-dimensional simulation as uh, elaborate as it might be still requires uh, engineering judgment and uh, for typical design, I think it's still very difficult, but maybe for special projects, there is room for, for it uh, at the present time. And hopefully in the future, uh, more uh, scenarios would benefit from that. I think one more question. Okay, I think uh, one, one more is there, okay. So inside, okay, I think computational resources Professor Algarman has already shared, so no need to answer this question. Uh, then what is the limit up to which what deformation public strains can, we can allow in FEM? This is the one question post. I yes. <laughs> what is the limit up to what deformation strain we can allow in FEM? Again, a very insightful question. And to some extent, it's really uh, the, uh, the response quantity of interest is what governs where you might start thinking that numerical analysis isn't providing enough insight. So sometimes if you're looking at overall response, you might get something reasonable. But if you're looking at local response, uh, you have to keep in mind that strains can be very large. And uh, if the mesh is refined further, the answer would change and hopefully improve. If there are uh, uh, nonlinear mechaniz mechanisms happening between the structural elements and the soil, as much and as hard as we try to capture those, there are other things that are happening that aren't captured. And so, uh, If utmost attention is given to all these details, I think uh, deformation, the resulting deformations uh, might be realistic. But on the other hand, always think about things that might not be well represented in the finite element model, and that uh, if these things might have an effect on the outcome, then you need to look at that independently of the numerical analysis and use engineering judgment. From the Q and A, uh, hopefully Professor has answered all the doubts. So I thank you, Professor Algaman, for uh, clearing all the doubts of the attendees. My pleasure. Thank you very much. So thanks, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Professor Ahmed. Uh, on behalf of organizers, we thank our esteemed speakers, Professor Algaman and uh, Prof, uh, Professor Charles Ng. It's indeed a great pleasure to be part of this uh, particular uh, session. And uh, Professor Elgamal is actually a teacher of my teacher, Professor G.V. Ramana. Thank you, sir.
thank you very much and also we we are very much honored uh, to host professor uh, charles ng who is a president of issmge it is uh, international society for our all the soil uh, mechanics engineers so our uh, indian geotechnical society is a part of issmge thank you sir for sparing your valuable time and addressing our uh, uh, august uh, audience thank you and i also thank dr reddy and uh, dr vishwas for nicely conducting the session uh, thank you, uh, thank you all the participants for participating and uh, now i request all the participants to move on to the parallel sessions which are going to be started uh, now thank you sir one and all thank you great thank to you. see you all thank you thank you nice see you all thank you that was nice nice talk yeah thank, thank you and you gave excellent talk too so let's keep in touch yes. okay i hope to meet you soon yes look forward <laughs> yeah take care take care bye everybody bye bye, bye, -bye everyone bye 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 thank you bye.